Just a few announcements before we begin our service this morning, and all that I have are in 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 the bulletin. Uh, today is All Saints Sunday and Holy Communion. Bible study Monday evening at seven o'clock. Wednesday's office hours regular and, uh, at six thirty on Wednesday will be Ed Council. And we move to the next to next week, next Sunday. Uh, there's there's notes there about harvest home and food items. Uh, I'm not going to read through them. You can do that yourself. Point seven order, orders are due next Sunday, Monday, November thirteenth. No no Bible study. And Pastor Tina will be away. And a silent retreat from November 13th to November 5th to November, November 15th. And there's a PPRC meeting listed on there for November the 15th. Those will have to make a note of that. Are there any other announcements? Anyone have? Just a big thank you to those who came out yesterday to help clean up the church and the grounds. Yes. We had a good, good thank time. You. Thank you, Dale, for leading that. Other announcements? I have Diane has an announcement here. Oh, it was beautiful nonetheless. <laughs> it will be beautiful afterwards too. I just wanted to bring everybody up to speed after our, our church conference Thursday evening. At the church conference, if you don't know, that is where the annual salary and benefits are set for the following year, as well as the percentages within our charge for what our portion of the expenses will be. After the annual conference, it was determined that we would be at 52% of the charge expenses as well as Christ would be at 48. What does that mean for us? That means right now with the proposed budget for next year for our charge, that is an additional um, of a little bit over $8,000 per year that we are now responsible for. So I just want to ask each of you sitting here, and if you're joining us virtually, to be in prayer not only for our church, for our charge, for those specifically who will be sitting down and working on the budget for next year, because we do not currently have a budget that has a lot of fat built into it, if at all. We have very little extra expenses but we don't have a budget that's thriving right now. And with these added expenses, I know that God will see us through. I trust that he will guide us. I ask you, as Pastor Tina has been challenging us in the last couple weeks, to be open to hearing God speaking to us and for us to be in communication with him so that we can truly hear where he's leading us and what our paths will be. Thank you.
If you are able, would you rise and join together in a call to worship? On this All Saints Day, we gather to join the multitude of saints across the generations from all tribes, peoples, and languages to proclaim salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. We come to remember, to grieve, and to celebrate those saints who have come before, yet whose life and witness continues to teach us. Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. We gather today as the family of Christ, siblings and saints, diverse yet united by grace to live lives that declare salvation belongs to our god who is seated on the throne and to the land may we forget, may we be guided today by the lamb who is our shepherd the one who gathers us comforts us and tends us May we join in the work of the shepherd to bring about a world where all the saints of the past, the present, and the future may share in God's abundant life. Amen. Our invitation to God this morning is something beautiful. Saints Day provides an opportunity to remember the promises of eternity. It's a day to honor the memory of loved ones lost, 
a day to acknowledge our own mortality. It's also an opportunity to look through all that is surrounding us now towards a future that looks significantly different. It's a call to action to live into the kingdom of God where there is no hunger or thirst. And there is comfort for those who mourn and for those who suffer. It's a day for hope and to, to acknowledge God's grace. We remember the multitudes who have gone before and look to them as a promise and a beacon of light in our darkness. So let us celebrate them with honor and love. Lord God, we name before you those saints who remain here in our hearts and minds, yet who've gone on to join your eternal church. As I read each name, please come forward to light your family member or your loved one's candle in their honor. You have the names before you. We recognize first Larry Lehman, who was born on December 11, 1941, and who passed into eternal life on November 24, We recognize Philip Drush, who was born on December 6, 1938, and entered into eternal life December 5, 2022. We recognize Larry Wyland, who was born on April 3, 1935, <coughs> entered into eternal life on December 30, 2020. We remember Paul Renais, who was born on June 1st, 1947, and entered into eternal life on February 4th, 2023. We remember Richard Poor, who was born on October 13th, 1935, and entered into eternal life February 27th. Born on March 10, 1983, entered into eternal life on April 26, 2023. We remember Gloria Asper, who was born on June 11, 1944, and entered into eternal life on May 8, 2023. Remember Susan Mason, who was born on September 25, 1952, and entered into eternal rest on October 17, 2023. And we remember the Reverend Earl Barrett, 
who was born March 22, 1936, and entered into eternal life October 18, 2023. light one more candle, the one in the back, to remember all those others in our lives who have passed away, both in the last year and also beyond. May their memories live on in our hearts. Holy Lord, we give you thanks and praise for sharing these wonderful people with us and for the opportunity to honor the memory of their lives. Comfort us in our grief and strengthen us for the days ahead. And let us join together in our prayer for All Saints Day, which is found on page 713 and also on your screen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect into one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Grant us grace so to follow your holy saints, in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those unspeakable joys, which you have prepared for those who sincerely love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us stand now and join together in our opening hymn for all the saints. Number seven. <laughs>
They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the formal, former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals who will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. The people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Grace be to God. Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Many of us, I would assume, have pleasant childhood memories of riding our bicycles with our friends. I have a sense of nostalgia when I recall the freedom my bicycle gave me, the ability to go wherever I wanted in my neighborhood, and the joy that that brought me. I can remember a sense of accomplishment that I felt the day that I learned to balance so well I could ride without holding on to the handlebars. I would imagine that I was flying. It was a feeling of exhilaration and delight. But I wonder if any of us remember the specific task of learning how to ride our bicycles in front of Do you remember who taught you? Where did you practice? What did your bike look like? What color was it? Mine had one of those big banana seats. I loved it. Now, perhaps it was a family member or a friend who taught you, or perhaps maybe you were self-taught, but I think the one thing we probably all share is that we didn't study it from a book. We didn't attend a lecture on physics or study centrifugal force. Instead, we learned intuitively that when we take a turn, we have to lean in, or we'll fall. And we have to lean in just the right amount. If we lean too far, we'll fall, and if we don't lean enough, we're not going to make our turn. So leaning in makes perfect sense to anyone who knows how to ride a bicycle. But there are other things we have to lean into in life that may not be so obvious. Hold on to that thought as we explore this morning's scripture lesson. This is probably one of my favorite passages from Isaiah. The prophet is speaking to the Jewish community who had been in exile for 70 years. This was after Solomon's temple had been destroyed and the Jews had been forcibly relocated to Babylon. They were living away from the Holy Land, away from the land of promise and the land of the covenant. Now, eventually, the Babylonian Empire was replaced by the Persian Empire, and shortly thereafter, the Persian Emperor Cyrus issued a decree allowing the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their city and their temple. Now, you would think that that would be a cause for joy, elation, celebration, and immediate plans to go back to Jerusalem. But do you know what really happened? Many of the Israelites were not willing to make the trip. Why do you think? Well, there are a couple of reasons, but first, many of the Jews had become fairly successful in their new residences. They had built homes, farms, and vineyards. They had become involved in local government and politics. And you have to remember that they've been in the land of 
exile for several generations. I mean, the younger people, they'd been born there. They never had even seen Jerusalem. They were comfortable in Babylon. And they were fearful of the unknown. Now, some of them, though, had nostalgia about God working mightily in the past because they remembered, Isaiah reminds them in this passage, about the parting of the Red Sea and how God had delivered them from the Egyptian army. But you know, then in verse 18, Isaiah says this. He says, forget those things from the past. Don't get stuck in nostalgia because it's preventing you from seeing God in the present. The Israelites couldn't see God working in the present, and they were immobilized by fear. You know, fear affects our lives in a variety of ways. Some fears are helpful. They protect us. Others are not so helpful. We've heard of the fight-or-flight reactions, right? But you know there's a third response, which is freeze. In the case of the Israelites, they experienced that third response. They were frozen. They were like the deer caught in the headlights. Their fear caused them to freeze in place. Now, if you're a wild animal living in a forest full of predators, those reactions are helpful. They're defense mechanisms meant to preserve life. But for humans, living in a civilized community, those reactions become problematic because they prevent us from working through our problems in an emotionally and spiritually healthy way. I think we've all experienced the flight or fight or flight or freeze reactions when facing trials, tribulations, or temptations. And we've all probably experienced the sometimes troublesome consequences of those reactions. I can think of an example from my own childhood. In my house, the dad was the disciplinarian. He was the one who laid down the line gave me permission to share this story, by the way. When I grew up, I was the third of six children, and when I was little, and one of my siblings or I did something wrong, my father would yell at us. He would say, now that is from your own stupidity. He would say this whenever we messed up, when we broke something, or when we failed to live up to his expectations. And then if something was amiss in our house and no one would fess up, he would line us all up, all six of us, we would line up in the living room, and we had to stand there until someone confessed. We would all be frozen in fear, right? So in my house growing up, I learned to avoid my father any time something went wrong. Now, I didn't necessarily avoid doing bad things. I just learned to avoid getting caught by my father. I never wanted to confess anything to my dad, even if I'd made the tiniest mistake because my fear caused me to freeze and want to run away, to never admit weakness, ever. You know, there are other things in our lives that cause us to want to run away. Things like grief. On this All Saints Day, we have a lot of candles lit this morning. Many of us in this congregation have experienced significant losses in our lives. Now, each passing hits us a little differently, and we all process grief uniquely. On March 6th of 2022, I lost my good friend, mentor, and spiritual director, Pastor Peggy Spengler. Now, her loss affected me emotionally and spiritually in ways I never expected. Now, she and I had met every week for mentoring sessions for an entire year prior to her passing. Each week we met and she poured so much of herself into me and into my ministry. So when she died, I felt lost and all alone. And even now, a year and a half later, I still find myself grieving her for loss. It usually hits me when I'm in my car listening to the radio, a song will come on, and it reminds me of Peggy start crying all over again. Now, when it initially happened, 
I was hurting so much that I even started questioning God about my call into ministry. I mean, how could I go on without my mentor? I started doubting my ability to minister to others experiencing grief. And all those fears made me want to run away. I got caught in this unrealistic expectation that I, I needed to always be strong to be a pastor. But my fear was threatening to either immobilize me or make me want to run away. So when fear prevents us from growing and moving on in our lives, we get stuck, don't we? Physically, emotionally, spiritually. And we can run the risk of falling into hopelessness and despair. Fear and grief can sometimes prevent us from seeing or perceiving God working in our lives. The Israelites from today's Old Testament story were immobilized by fear, yet the prophet Isaiah was able to speak into that fear and remind them of God's goodness and provision. Isaiah reminded them that God can make a way where there is no way, like creating springs out of dry land. God can do wondrous and amazing things, things we never thought possible. Isaiah's words proclaim boldly the goodness of God. Even in verse 20, it says that animals proclaim God's goodness and praise God for God's provision. Even the animals. Now, Isaiah was speaking into the lives of the Israelites and encouraging them to look for God in their trials. He was pointing out where God was, what God does, and who God is. He tells them to lean in to God. This is the theme that Isaiah carries throughout this book. And in chapter 10, verse 20, it reads like this. On that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on the one who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And we jump to today's verse in chapter 43, and Isaiah reminds the Israelites that instead of being afraid, they can lean on to God. Isaiah reminds them that God can make a way where they see no way. And in verse 19, Isaiah asks his fellow Israelites, do you not perceive it? In other words, do you not see God making a way for you? People often take that verse and use it to justify just about any change, especially change in the church. But I think that Isaiah is saying here that in times of trial or tribulation, we must intentionally look for God. We must, we must search for God's unexpected blessings. Now God was preparing a way for the Israelites to return to Jerusalem. God was making a way for them. God was saying, lean into me, and I will provide. Lean into me, and I will protect. Lean into me, and I will bless you in unexpected ways. So in our times of trial or grief, we too need someone to proclaim to us where God is, what God does, and who God is. When we are experiencing grief, frustration, anger, we must lean into God. You know, when I was facing grief and my doubts and my fears, my first reaction was to think that I just needed to be stronger. I was reverting back to my childhood defense mechanism of avoiding confessions at all costs and putting on a strong front. I thought I needed to be a pastor with all the right answers and all the right words to say. But I didn't have those words. And then I remembered that Bible verse that says, My power is made perfect in weakness. So while experiencing the loss of Peggy was devastating, I learned firsthand what deep grief is like. It showed me what kinds of words and actions were helpful when people said them to me, and what things were less helpful. 
And it has given me so much more empathy for those who are struggling with grief. You know, the one image that I saw over and over again as I was praying through my grief was the image of Jesus sitting next to me with his arm around me, crying right along with me. During my prayer times, God reminded me that God is not an authoritative father looking to punish me in times of trouble. When we confess our weaknesses to God, God lovingly, gently takes us up into God's arms and wipes away all our tears. In times of trouble or grief, God gives us wisdom and encouragement. During my prayer times, I felt like I heard God telling me to lean in to my grief and to lean into God. God said, don't push away your feelings. Don't try to be strong. Lean into your grief. That was not my first instinct. I wanted to run from my grief, push it away. But as I started to obey God, and I started to see God do amazing things in my heart. And God reassured me that if I lean into him, he will make a way where I see no God will make springs in the desert. God will be strong where I am weak. God will be my guide. And just like learning how to ride a bike, I will learn by doing. I will learn by falling a few times. But soon enough, I will learn to lean in just the right amount. When we lean into God, we start seeing, we start perceiving that God is doing a new thing. God is working for our good. Right now. Do you not perceive it? God is making a way where we see no way. Will we trust God? In our grief, will we run from God or towards God? Now, some people read this Old Testament verse and say that it points to the future, that they say the prophet was announcing that God was preparing an unexpected blessing in Christ Jesus. You hear it a lot at Christmas time. Now, I believe that that is an accurate inter interpretation, but not the only interpretation. I believe Isaiah's prophecy speaks on three levels. First, it spoke to the Israelites about their fear of moving back to Jerusalem. Second, it spoke to the future coming of the Messiah. And thirdly, it speaks to us today in our present reality. God is at work in our world today, in our church today, no matter what our circumstances look like. You know, sometimes as we get closer to the holidays, our grief takes on a different, more poignant flavor. We face the first Thanksgiving without our loved one and maybe the first Christmas. And we can easily fall into despair and hopelessness. We can decide that we won't celebrate this year, and that's okay. We all process grief differently. We all have different coping mechanisms. But just know this. If the grief becomes too unbearable, especially this time of year, you don't need to suffer in silence. Putting on a brave face when we feel like crying is not grieving well. But admitting our weaknesses is. And seeking the help of a trained counselor is not admitting defeat. It's actually a sign of strength and wisdom. Jesus is the great physician, and he cares about our mental and emotional well-being. And there are Christian counselors in our community that you can connect with. And that can help you. We know that because of Christ, there is always hope. Christ is the one who not only sees our pain, but shares in it. Christ doesn't remove our pain. But as we cry, Jesus puts an arm around us and cries with us. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, always near and always willing to create springs in the desert, even the desert of our own hearts. 
So this All Saints Day, let us remember to lean into God, to look for God's unexpected blessings. Because God is always good. God is always near. And God is always working in our midst. Do you not perceive it? Let us pray. God of all creation, who makes streams in the desert, give us eyes to see and ears to hear you working in our lives, so that we may be filled with hope, love, and joy. And let this love overflow from us like springs of living water, so that we may be witnesses of your glory and grace for all the world to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. stand now and sing together our hymn of response.
the Evan Weaver family, an eight-year-old boy from Shippensburg who lost his battle with cancer. to you with praise and thanksgiving for the blessings you bring. Thank you for this church building, for this church family, and for leading us. Jesus, there are those among us needing your healing, your comfort, and your peace. So here are prayers we ask as we spend a moment in silent prayer to you. Oh God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we confess that we are frequently slow to believe what you have promised through your prophets and in your son Jesus. We sometimes succumb to fears of death as if it were the end of everything. And all too often we live as if there is nothing to live for beyond death. So forgive us, Lord, of our doubts and disbelief. And grant that we might see beyond the ruins that may lie about us, that we might take to heart the lessons of Scripture which testify to your willingness and ability to bring new life to dry bones. Give all those who despair a vision of the resurrection which awaits all those who believe. Help us to order our lives by the principles of your everlasting kingdom, by faith, hope, love. God, help us to be a people prepared for the journey ahead. Remove from us all evil desire. Take away any refusal to forgive others. Lift from us any reluctance to love our enemies. Holy Spirit, send us the desire to love one another as Jesus loves us. All this we ask in the holy name of Jesus. Now we will continue in our worship with our tithes and our offerings. We ask your space to come
join in the communion of the saints. We join with new members, which will be joining at Christ Church this morning. We join with longtime members and those members who have already gone on to glory to celebrate and say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on the bread and the cup that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, that we may take of this sacrament with the reverence it deserves as a holy, sacred, Recognizing that there are times when we too must take up our own crosses, bear the full weight of our grief and sorrow, and come to you with contrite hearts. Yet as we come to the table, confessing our sins and laying our hurts and disappointments at your feet, we come knowing our sins are forgiven, and that by your stripes we are healed. In gratitude we pledge to forgive and to love others, just as we have been forgiven and loved. <coughs> holy God, we ask for your holy wisdom as we join together at your table and also look forward to feasting with you someday in heaven. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us
blood of Christ shed for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. God be in your heart and in your thinking. God be 